Uh, good morning again. Uh, for those of you who have joined us later, I'm Gerald Newman, the director of the Human Rights Program, uh, and I am here to learn. Uh, this is the first panel of the day on participation of African states in shaping international law. Uh, I must say, as a human rights lawyer, uh, I can never forget the role that the anti-apartheid movement played uh, in jump-starting uh, the human rights movement at the United Nations uh, after it had been stalled uh, by the Cold War. Uh, but we're here to learn from the panelists, whom I will now introduce. Uh, James Gathy, immediately to my right, uh, is the Wingtot Lee Chair in International Law and Professor of Law at Loyola University Chicago School of Law. Professor Gathy's research and teaching interests are in public international law, international trade law, third world approaches to international law, comparative constitutional law, and human rights. Uh, he's a founding member of the Twail Network and an elected member of the International Academy of International Law. He sits on the board of editors, among others, of the Journal of African Law, the Journal of International Trade Law and Policy. He's co-editor-in-chief of the African Journal of International Economic Law and a founding editor of Afronomics Law and one of the conveners of the African Sovereign Debt Justice Network. Uh, to his right, Alpha Sese is the Deputy Minister of Justice for Sierra Leone. Uh, before his appointment to this position, he worked with USAID and the Open Society Foundations. Uh, Mr. Sesse, Minister Sesse, uh, has had extensive experience working in the field of international human rights, international criminal justice, and on broader issues relating to accountability for atrocity crimes, uh, as well as litigation and advocacy uh, before regional and international human rights mechanisms. Uh, he has done work in the context of the Special Court for Sierra Leone and the International Criminal Court in The Hague, and regional human rights bodies including the ECOWAS Court, uh, the African Commission, and the Court on Human and, in, on human and People's Rights. Uh, I'm happy to say he is also a former visiting fellow at the Harvard Law School Human Rights Program uh, in the relatively recent past. Uh, Charles Jallo uh, is currently a William Clay Distinguished Visiting Professor of law, International Law at Boston University School of Law. Uh, he is Distinguished University Professor of International Law at Florida International University and the founder of the Center for International Law and Policy in Africa. Uh, he's a member and special rapporteur of the, U Inter the UN International Law Commission. Uh, formerly a Fulbright Distinguished Chair in Public International Law at Lund University, he has published widely in the field of international law. He serves on the editorial boards of several scholarly journals, including the African Journal of Legal Studies uh, and the American Journal of International Law. Professor Jallo was a legal advisor in the Special Court for Sierra Leone and an associate legal officer in the International Criminal Tribu Tribunal for Rwanda. Uh, I'm sorry to say that our fourth panelist, Professor Phoebe Okoa of Queen Mary University of London, uh, is uh, unfortunately unable to join us today. Uh, so with that, um, let us begin. Uh, I give the first word to Professor Gathy. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Newman. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, to Kai, all the organizers, and for putting me I don't know what I deserve to be put on this distinguished panel. I'm also an alum of the Harvard Human Rights Program. Uh, 30 years ago, I was sent to Washington, D.C. by the Summer Stipend Program to work with Gay McDougall in Washington, D.C. Uh, I was licking envelopes as a student in the Human Rights Program <laughs> to make money to survive as a graduate student. Um, and um, I was on the board of the Harvard Human Rights Journal, one of the very first pieces I ever published uh, um, so, I, um, but I'm here to learn, like you, Professor Newman, um, and in particular, I've been listening very keenly, like I was the excellent opening address by 
Dr. Gweldich. Uh, uh, and I'm going to be looking forward to learn because very soon we are we're having an event in Washington, D.C. for Nomics Law on the sidelines of the uh, World Bank IMF meetings on uh, climate finance and, um, and sovereign debt. Uh, and we have some upcoming litigation as well uh, in Africa. So uh, I'll be listening very keenly today. So I hope that doesn't count in my time. So I've said two <laughs> things in my, in my <laughs> 10 or so minutes. First, I, I want to make a point very similar to the keynote we just had, that Africa is an epistemic, epistemic site of knowledge production in international law. And I'll focus uh, uh, on some examples from the early part of the 20th century to make that argument. Uh, and second, I'll put on the table three typologies of African approaches to international law that I actually been developing since I was a student in this very law school many years ago. So, writing in 1963, Hans Bade, a professor of international at Duke Law School, and Robin, Robinson O. Everett, another Duke University law professor, argued, quote, there was typically no African school of international legal thought, as contrasted, say, with Latin American doctrine. Um, they further astoundingly concluded that there was little danger to traditional Western values lacking in a specific African conception of law, national or international. Uh, Bade and Everett were projecting a very Hegelian view of Africa, very similar to uh, what I think um, we just had um, that uh, engineered this conference, uh, that uh, Africa was a land without history, without law, um, uh, a view uh, that is based on the pseudo-scientific lies about white superiority uh, and that relegated Africa uh, to geography uh, and to quote Hegel, uh, enveloped in the mantle of the night, lacked universal reason, reason or rationality. We have to be very clear why conferences like this are very important is because those views still pervade many disciplines um, and I walk the halls of academia. I can tell you they are there, uh, and I have done empirical work to show that. Now, what Everett and uh, Budded, uh, they were writing in 1963, so this is important, 1963. Um, just a few years before, in 1955, delegates from 29 countries from Asia and Africa convened the Bangdung Conference in Indonesia to discuss the common challenges, just like we are now, climate change, navigating a post-colonial world. The Asian African Conference, popularly known as the Bandung Conference, was a sensation around the world. But they didn't seem to know about this. This is infuriating. That conference placed colonialism and anti-colonialism as the central event of the 20th century. Contrary to what academics and others in international relations were telling us, that it was the Second World War was, that was the central event uh, of uh, the 20th century. As other world-making as an other world-making project, the Bandung Conference opened up multiple histories of international law that had been displaced, ignored, and undermined by mainstream tellings of international legal history. First generation Twila, Mohammed Bejawi, characterized decolonization as a structural, quote, structural revolution on a world scale in his book towards a new international economic order. Um, so I could say many things about Badi and Everett. Uh, but I want to also note, 1963 was also the year the OAU, the Organization of African Unity, was formed out of two major groups. I'll not go into the history, the Casablanca, the Casablanca group, uh, as well as the more radical, and in my view, more favorable Monrovia group. But how could Buddy and Everett not have known this? This was the year the OAU was established. 1960 was also, so I want to go decade by decade. So let me start with the 60s, just to see how uh, this Bade and Everett view holds up. 1960 was the year of Africa, as declared by Ralph Bunch. It was the year that 10 African states became independent. Decolonization was not simply in the air, it was the life of international law in the period. Uh, as Professor Newman has just noted, and as I'll be noting in a few minutes, uh, African state uh, brought back to life norms of human rights in the struggle against an, uh, anti-apartheid, and especially in their solidarity with groups like the NAACP. The 1950s, so 60s, I, have, I could say more about the 60s. Let's go to the 50s. 1950s was a period of uh, intense anti-colonial organizing. How could these guys at Duke 
in North America not have known about this. The NAACP was closely collaborating with the fledgling African National Congress to oppose World Bank loans to grow the growing uh, apartheid state in South Africa. A whole raft of African Americans in alliance with the ANC were opposed to South African uranium exports because this was exactly the same time the US was developing the atomic bomb. How could these guys not have known this? Well, anyway, so. Um, the 1950s and 60s also witnessed many liberation movements, including the very consequential Algerian War of Independence from France that helped to reframe rules of armed conflict to accommodate liberation movements. One only know the work of uh, leading 12 jurist, George Isabisal. The 1940s was a pivotal moment in the struggle that established the universality of self-determination as a norm that applied to all. It had been not applied to Africa until then. Um, and, you know, let me just tell this story without my, reading my notes. Uh, this was really a pivotal moment because African nationalists, for the first time, met with people like uh, W.E. Du, e. B. du Bois. And Du Bois and the NAACP at the time believed that the way to achieve African self-determination uh, was actually not full determination, not full self-determination, but rather was to establish trusteeships. That was the view of NAACP. And it was not until W.E.B. Du Bois met in Kuruma, Kenyatta and the Namdi Azikiwes, that they changed their view, that the NAACP changed their view, that full independence for Africans, not something in between, was what was needed. Um, <clears throat> and I could say more about this, uh, about how in particular, uh, in the fourth and the first committees of the United Nations, Africans uh, 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 collaborating with uh, delegates from Haiti, the first black republic, uh, and uh, with uh, the NAACP that infiltrated the delegations uh, of the United States to the United Nations, uh, were able to achieve uh, many success, including fighting back uh, fascist Italy's designs in Ethiopia. Uh, so the 1930s, uh, the, the Ethiopia valiantly resists the fascist Italian invasion uh, and led a major debate about the tenability of rules prohibiting the use of force in the League of Nations Charter, um, a story told not just by Carol Anderson in her book, Bourgeois Radicals, but also by 1970s generations of Africans like SKB Asante. 1920s, the League of Nations seeking precedent-setting permanent court of international justice advisory opinions on the effects of nationalist decrees issued by Tunisia and Morocco on British subjects. My favorite, 1900s. So how could Bade and Everett not known, have known all this stuff? Um, the 1900s, the Maasai of Kenya went to the British courts to challenge their removal from their territory inconsistently with the 1904 treaty between the Maasai and the British. That case, like many others, in colonial Africa raised important international legal questions, such as whether the Maasai were a sovereign people uh, as a sovereign people who had entered into the treaty relations with the British could sue the British in domestic courts. Whether residents in the East African Protectorate could bring suit against the Crown. Whether the East African Protectorate was a protectorate or effectively a colony because relief sought depended on the status of that territory. Whether the act of state doctrine precluded such suit. These are classic international law questions being litigated in the 1900s. Uh, and they were cited in subsequent cases brought by African nationalists in many cases against the British, like Expate Mwenye, another very important case, which is cited in yet another really important precedent setting case right here in the United States by the Supreme Court of the United States, Rasul versus Bush, on the question of the availability of the writ of habeas in Guantanamo Bay. And I could go on. This is all just to say that the racist views that Bad and Everett espoused about there being no discernible approach to international law from Africa ignored the ways in which Africans, in alliance with other black internationalists, were producers of knowledge of international law. These black internationalists organized Pan-African Congresses from 1900 to 1945, where they hotly debated. They never agreed. We, the today tailors, also don't agree um, uh, on issues they honed their argument. They took those arguments to newspapers, to the UN, to their publics, to governments, to anyone who cared to listen to them. But apparently, Bade and Everett, and there are many Bades and Everett even today, um, did not care about these views. In a recent really stellar PhD dissertation 
titled News from Pan Africa, Black Internationalism, Literature and International Law, 1900 to 1963, Christopher Givers, a white African in South Africa, argued powerfully uh, the, how the world-making processes of African international lawyers and their history, uh, and their literally counterparts in the first part of the 20th century, provided counterpoint to white supremacist imaginaries of international law that dominated notions of global order and its presumed neutrality and emancipatory potential. So that's the first part of my presentation. And now I'll tell you the story about the work that I've been doing since I was a student here. Um, and when I started this work, trying to sketch out African approaches to international law and published my first article in 1998 on this question, um, I was trying to um, I was trying to figure out a question posed to me by many others, including my doctoral supervisor, David Kennedy, who said, what international kind of international lawyer do you want to be? Do you want to be like Elias Olawale, for example, or do you want to be like Mohammed Bejawi? Um, and I didn't know at the time that uh, this project um, that I got into would get me in a lot of trouble with many of my friends. Um, I had no idea that people would pick these typologies turn them upside down, challenge them, extend them, critique them, blah, 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 blah. So contributionism is school number one. And second school and, uh, is the critical approaches. And in the more recent past, I have um, thought that maybe there's an intermediate approach between the two. So these are typologies. So let me start with contributionism. How am I doing on time? The time is yours. <laughs> <laughs> this will be good. Um, so, um, so this approach, contributionism, pervaded most of the writing and thinking uh, from Africa in the immediate post-colonial period. And I would argue it still has a lot of resonance today. It's premised on the view that the world is comprised of multiple civilizations and that Africa, as one example of such civilizations or multiple civilizations, has participated in crafting genuinely universal norms. Um, and as I said, uh, Taslim Elias Olawale um, his work exemplifies this approach best. Another, another way of saying this is that international is a product of many civilizational contributions, and Africa is simply one of them. If Makao Mutua, the former director of the Human Rights Program, who was the director when I was here, would be here, he'd say, you know, this idea that, you know, international is like a pot on three stools, on three stones, and, you know, all the cultures are putting all their uh, stuff in the pot, something like that. And then start and mix. That's the whole idea. Um, so contribution is counter the idea that international law, the Hegelian idea, the Bade Everett idea, that international law um, is exclusively European and African uh, had no participation in it. Um, another technique that uh, contributionists argue is to say that long before colonial rule, uh, Africa was connected to European trade and commerce and, 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 and large empires that really compared in every respect to those in Europe. Um, in my view, as you could tell, maybe from my tone, um, my students say sometimes that I manipulate them with my tone, contributionism overstates the participation of diverse, by diverse community constituencies in the creation of global norms and understates the ways in which rules of international law justified colonial imperial rule and how those legacies live with us today. In fact, in Elias's book, uh, uh, African International Law, published in 1972, um, he says colonialism was a short interlude uh, where the sovereignty of Africa was suspended. Otherwise, African sovereignty has always been continuous. Now, critical theories, school number two, approach number two. Colonialism was not a short interlude. Colonialism is everything. Um, and in particular, uh, for Twelers, in the critical tradition, something that I think we may have founded in this very room in 1997, um, For Twillers, uh, the Bade and Everett view, and sometimes contributionism, assume or occupy the same intellectual tradition as some of the people who deny uh, that Africa contributed, um, that, that, that sort of uh, Af deny Africa contributed to international law, and, and ignore the way colonialism coerced consent from Africans. Contributionists 
ignore how colonialism and its legacies such as slavery were and continue to be constitutive of international law. Critical theorists, Twillers, show that despite the pro promise of formal equality and self-determination of states in the post-Second World era, the imperial nature of the international system characterized by an equal status continues today. Think of the weighted voting systems of Bretton Woods institutions, think about the undemocratic nature of the UN Security Council, blah, 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 blah. By contrast, um, uh, so, so African critical scholars of the post-Second World War era also focused on power and wealth imbalances between African countries and the rest of the world. This is what I do in my work, International Economic Law. I don't want to talk too much about that today. Um, and in those structures, we examine the continuities of colonialism and imperialism, um, whether it's in international trade law, whether it's in international investment law, uh, whether it's in another area I'm working on, as I said, in sovereign debt, um, uh, and so on and so forth. So finally, there's an intermediate approach. Uh, that I associate with Kembambai. Uh, and here, I just sort of want to mention, just to make this a little more clearer, uh, Kemba's, Kembambai's approach, especially on the question of the right to development, which in his view, um, and in my view, unites aspects of both the critical and the contributionist traditions on international law. Because unlike the contributionists who have this strict pub public-private divide, they almost tell us nothing about the structural questions of the global economy, for example, or uh, the unpleasant histories. Uh, Kemba Bayer doesn't ignore these unpleasant histories. He actually works with them very well. And I categorize Bayer in this intermediate category between contributionist and critical theorists because of how he appealed to notions of a common or shared humanity, as well as what he referred to as common values to justify the right to development. He argued that international conscience, as well as the well-being and justice, as part of his broader vision of universal solidarity, justified the right to development. Unlike contributionists, he rejected legal formalism and argued that legal formalism was a narrow positivist, uh, philosophical positivism. That his resort, thus, he resorted to natural law, which in his view embraced ethic, universal ethical values and universal civilization as a foundation for the recognition of the right to development. I could say more about Kembambai, but um, he also, um, uh, relies very heavily on European philosophers, uh, and in fact, you know, my fav one of my favorite quotes from him uh, is his invocation of Kant, uh, arguing that um, that none better than Kant to come to our aid in the search for an ethic of development, because it must be a categorical imperative. So that really concludes my, my remarks. Uh, and the only last thing I'll say as a footnote is to say that I'm really delighted to be also on this panel, especially with these two gentlemen to my right, and, and also uh, very much admiring the work that Charles is doing in the International Law Commission, uh, particularly, uh, I know he won't say this, um, uh, he's doing really important work uh, bringing all these questions to the International Law Commission, perhaps for the first time uh, since Mohammed Bajoy was on the commission. So um, I'll not embarrass him any further. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for uh, those observations uh, and for embarrassing a panelist. Uh, Mr. Sisse, if I could just ask you to twist your microphone a little toward you because it's important that it catch you. Uh, please, go ahead. All right, thank you. Thank you, Professor Newman. That's good, good. Um, good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's, it's really great to be here and um, um, to, well, see some old faces and um, meet some, some new people. And of course, you know, it's an incredible honor to share the panel with these um, um, two gentlemen, and then, of course, you know, to be introduced by um, um, Professor Neiman. Last time I was here um, at the Harvard Law School, I was here as a visiting fellow. Um, um, at the time, um, I was really here doing research on state implementation of decisions of human rights mechanisms. And um, at that time, I was um, part of a team of lawyers, you know, working with open society foundations um, and with um, a broader constituency of lawyers on the African continent um, filing cases um, before regional human rights mechanisms, you know, including um, the African Court and Commission on Human and People's Rights, the ECOWAS Court, um, the Committee of Experts on Rights and Welfare of the Child, etc. 
And um, you know, once decisions were delivered, we embarked on advocacy for implementation of these um, decisions. And like you all, um, I was concerned then as I am now, you know, um, about um, the challenges um, that we face, you know, when we talk about state compliance with um, these decisions. Um, now, of course, um, I am on the other side as part of government, you know, um, it is really my turn to answer these questions, you know, as to <laughs> um, why states um, are sometimes slow um, to implement these decisions. You know, maybe, um, you know, it's probably, you know, my turn to make sure that we do, you know, what I always advocate <laughs> to do. But that is really um, a, a discussion for another day, you know. Um, Professor Newman can count, the, count this out of my time. <laughs> 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 But um, for, the, for the purpose of um, 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 today's discussions, you know, I'm really proud that I still get to be part of um, some kind of um, litigation, um, but this time around in respect of, um, um, of climate change. Um, so um, I, I sit here to share um, some perspectives, um, not as an academic, you know, I leave that to the two gentlemen here and then of course to um, all the people um, in the audience. But um, I'm really here to um, share perspectives from um, a state that continues to deal with um, some of the deleterious effects um, of, of climate change, you know, and how um, it, it's affecting um, our, our people. And as, as many of you will know um, already, um, Sierra Leone is one of several countries um, which appeared before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in September last year. And um, um, most recently, you know, has made um, submissions before the um, International Court of Justice for an advisory opinion on state obligations in respect of damage caused to the environment. Um, last night, we um, had some discussions around this, and I think I remember um, Professor Jalo, you know, sharing his, his frustrations that um, at the ICJ, disappointing that you know, out of 54 countries, really only 11 countries. You know, um, um, I mean, I, I see this as progress, you know, because when we, when we did um, um, the submissions um, before the Law of the Sea Tribunal, it was seven African states, you know. Now at the ICJ, it's 11. So that's, that's progress, you know, and I think, you know, that will continue um, to increase, you know, as these discussions, um, um, as, as these discussions happen. But for Sierra Leone, you know, I'd like to really talk about why um, Sierra Leone has taken um, um, these important steps, you know, one before the Law of the Sea Tribunal and then um, and before the International Court of Justice, you know. Um, we have done so um, because of um, the already significant impacts um, of climate change for our country and, and its people. And um, we have taken this step because we note that um, you know, whilst the climate emergency poses um, the greatest threat to our planet and to this generation, um, there is simply no equity, you know, when it comes to managing its effects. <coughs> so it is really our hope of that um, the advisory opinions we seek from um, um, the ITLOS and the ICJ um, are opportunities um, to change that. Um, so we, we do note that Sierra Leone is among the lowest contributors of greenhouse gas emissions in the world. Um, and yet, you know, like other countries um, um, in, the, in the region, we are among the 10% of countries that are, that are most vulnerable to climate change. So it is really our hope that um, the advisory opinions will help clarify state obligations under international law, as well as also strengthen the foundation for um, um, equitable solutions to the climate emergency. Um, I'll make brief comments um, on the questions we have asked the tribunal to clarify in um, um, the advisory opinions for um, the um, Law of the Sea Tribunal, first um, really relating to the foundational question put before the tribunal by the Commission of Small Island States and International Law in its request for an advisory opinion, which to clarify how um, the Convention on the Law of the Sea obligations agreed upon more than four decades ago are uh, aligned with the demands of the climate emergency that the global community um, faces today. And um, for us, um, on this question, um, as a country, we have really listed three um, 
fundamental contributions, you know, which we think um, the tribunal um, can make, you know, um, as it responds to this foundational question. Um, first, you know, it is, um, I hope that the tribunal will, uh, will, will outline um, not just how these obligations under the convention might be interpreted under international law, but also interpreted in a manner that shows um, appropriate sensitivity to the disproportionate impact of the climate emergency on developing countries such, such as Sierra Leone. And we also hope uh, that um, um, the um, tribunal in responding to this question um, will set some historical record straight um, that um, the countries most affected by um, climate-induced changes to the marine environment, um, they've contributed very little to the problem. And um, um, for that, um, it is our view that, you know, there should be um, legal consequences, you know, um, as we try to, to tackle this, this global crisis. And um, finally, um, we also will hope that the tribunal will make clear um, that international law can play a meaningful role in offering solutions to addressing this, this practical problem. And um, um, which, you know, we hope the, the tribunal, you know, will use this to pay due regard um, to, to certain things, you know. One is um, um, differential cap capabilities of states to mitigate and adapt to the various harms caused um, by climate change. And um, um, that if we are to solve the climate challenge, those with the means must step up to their responsibilities and, and that those who have not been industrialized and are still developing uh, are essentially being asked to, to subsidize the polluters by being left to deal with the climate mess that is really not of their making. Um, in the context of um, um, the International Court of Justice, um, the United Nations General Assembly um, has made a request to the court to render advisory opinion on two questions. Um, our keynote speaker went through um, those questions already, so I'll save time by not going through those, you know. Um, but for us as a country, um, it is um, our hope that in responding to um, these um, questions, uh, the International Court of Justice will also um, consider questions of um, um, the obligations of states under international environmental law, um, under international human rights law, and um, um, the law uh, of the sea. So um, these questions, um, both for the Law of the Sea Tribunal and the International Court of Justice, um, really point to why um, these um, proceedings are important um, to Sierra Leone as a country. Um, you know, we s see them as an opportunity for law and justice to be served, not really just for Sierra Leone, but also for the many other developing countries, um, especially in the global south, that find themselves in a similar position. And um, really noting that these developing countries, um, which have contributed the least to um, the pollution um, of, for example, the marine environment and the atmosphere, uh, shouldering the disproportionate burden um, of the um, threats posed to our planet by the deleterious effects of cli climate change. So um, we, you know, as a country, believe that um, um, the polluters who produce um, most of the greenhouse gas emissions, you know, which really have got us to where we are today, um, um, they reap the benefits, you know, um, while we, the non-polluters, deal with the consequences, you know, and we pay for that, we pay the price. So really, it's, it's, um, I believe that um, the, the polluters, you know, who, um, the polluters must pay, that I, I believe. And so, um, so at this point, um, I'd, I'd just like to highlight um, um, a few examples of um, the multiple impacts um, of human-induced climate change um, um, in Sierra Leone, and you know, which really point to um, why we are here, you know, why we are before these, um, these tribunals. So um, for Sierra Leone, the risks from human-induced climate change you know, remain particularly high, and this is really due to our country's geography. Um, as a low-lying coastal um, state. So because of this, you know, um, the impacts are, are multiple. Um, we are talking about um, rising seas to force displ displacement of our people inhabiting certain islands and low-lying coastal areas. 
coastal areas to the dramatic um, changes um, to, for example, our fisheries economy. So for a country that is really heavily reliant on um, um, climate sensitive sectors, you know, such as um, um, rain dependent agriculture, natural resources, fisheries, um, for critical food security, employment opportunities, and export earnings, and the consequences of climate related disasters are, are, are high, you know, they're multiplied for that matter. Um, intense and frequent coastal flooding and heavy rainfall pose a significant threat to the most vulnerable communities and among these aggravates existing challenges like food security. And um, as a country that continues to recover from the experience of the violent conflict, um, Sierra Leone is particularly susceptible to the effects of worsened livelihood security, disrupted infrastructure, resource scarcity accelerated by climate change. Um, the, the harm that climate change is currently causing threatens to undo the hard fought progress um, that the country um, has made over the years. So we note that um, as a country, we are both um, um, susceptible to climate change impacts, and at the same time, um, we admit that we lack the capacity to adapt to these impacts. And this is not the case for Sierra Leone alone. Um, I can say so for several countries um, in that region, really noting that um, you know, the coastal ecosystems in West Africa are among the most vulnerable to climate change because of the extensive low-lying deltas exposed to sea level rise, erosion, salt water intrusion, and flooding. Um, already, sea level rise has caused um, significant challenges to livelihoods um, of our coastal inhabitants. Um, coastal erosion is taking place and resulting in shifting coastlines. And if no action is taken, a total of 26.4 square kilometers of Sierra Leone coastline is estimated to be lost to the sea by 2050. Um, sea level rise is expected to affect almost 2.3 million Sierra Leoneans who are at risk of experiencing a one meter rise of sea level along coastal areas. And we're talking about a population of about 8.5 million. So, I mean, already in various parts of Sierra Leone, um, islands have fallen victim to sea level rise. For, ex for instance, um, inhabitants of Le Yelibuya Island have had to be relocated due to flooding and, and, and partial and permanent inundation. So um, when people are displaced from coastal communities due to negative effects of, of climate change, they retreat inland, you know, and try to live um, in the mountains. And with so much pressure on hills and mountains caused by human, inhab human um, habitation, they are bound to the most mudslides, you know, the 2017 mudslide that saw the destruction of an entire community. Um, and more than 1,000 deaths in a space of few minutes gave visibility to the dark consequences of, climate, of the climate crisis and um, environmental destruction. But I'd also like to state that, um, um, you know, as a country, we are doing our part, you know. Um, we are not just, you know, sitting back and, um, um, you know, opening our arms for people to come and help, you know. Um, we, as a country, Sierra Leone has, taken has undertaken various measures um, to mitigate and, and adapt to the effects of climate change um, on our country, on our people. Um, we've taken significant steps to implement various projects over many years. But the stark reality um, is that as a developing state, um, Sierra Leone um, has limited resources. Um, we also have limited technological capacity to meet all the increasing demands of the climate problem. Um, finance is particularly important, is a particularly important barrier for government programs generally, and for ocean health, governance, and adaptation to climate change for Sierra Leone. And um, um, so if we are to respond to this crisis, it means um, we are really diverting resources that could be used to respond to other priorities um, in the country. You know, in, in, in September, um, I noted before the law of the sea tribunal um, that, um, you know, for a developing country like Sierra Leone, you know, what we put in climate related mitigation is actually food out of the mouths of our children. You know, it is money that we do not use to educate <laughs> our children. 
and in this morning we do not choose to not our sick children back to good health you know so um, um, that really tells you how um, um, this impacts um, a country um, like Sierra Leone so we, we therefore believe that um, the obligation to protect and preserve the environment must be understood in the context of state obligations under general international law and consistent with the principles of equitable burden sharing. We further believe that meaningful progress for the sake of all humanity requires strong international cooperation, certainly more cooperation than we, we have now. Um, talking about stronger, stronger, stronger international cooperation means providing sufficient financial and technical assistance to developing states um, consistent with the common but differentiated responsibilities principle. And as um, our president, President Julius Madabio, stated recently at the African Cl Climate Summit um, in September um, last year, said, you know, we're really here to collaborate. You know, we seek cooperation, not, not charity. So our hope um, is that the advisory opinions we seek before these tribunals will provide greater clarity on state party obligations in relation to the legal questions we have posed and that you know, they will give meaningful content to the common but differentiated responsibilities principle and the technical assistance provisions under international instruments, including the law of the sea um, convention. So Sierra Leone hopes that um, um, through these advisory opinions, um, the tribunals will really pronounce themselves in very clear terms on the legal obligations that um, may lead to actual prevention, reduction, and control of um, the marine pollution. Um, on that note, I would want to thank you for um, your audience and for the opportunity to share um, perspectives um, from, from Sierra Leone. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Jello, uh, I just want to make clear from the outside that your time starts now. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't, say when, I won't say when it ends, uh, other, to say, other than to say that uh, this panel is to, supposed to end at 10.45, uh, uh, and that uh, there might be some questions from the floor. That's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Newman. And it's a great pleasure uh, to be here, and I'm grateful uh, for the partnership uh, with the Hum Harvard Human Rights Program. And I'd like to uh, uh, big, give a big shout out uh, to Dr. Abadir Ibrahim and, of course, uh, Benya Mezo, who, as Abadir pointed out earlier, uh, for those of you who missed uh, the opening, um, were the two collaborators uh, that. Uh, trained some trepidations about the African voice in international law that led to this great opportunity and collaboration between the Harvard Human Rights Program, uh, the Center for International Law and Policy in Africa, uh, which is my way of giving back to Center based uh, in Freetown, Sierra Leone, and of course, uh, the Dula Omar Institute at the University of West Western Cape. I'm grateful to Professor Newman as well, um, and I take the cue about the time. Uh, this is always a challenge to be the last speaker, but I'm going to try to be com to be as concise as possible uh, because I think it would be a great regret after the fascinating uh, first keynote speech and then followed by a fascinating intervention by Professor Gavi and now uh, Deputy Minister Sisi to not have an exchange of views uh, with, with, with all of you uh, in the audience. Uh, James uh, embarrassed me. I was very embarrassed. Um, as they say in Sierra Leone, I will retaliate, but I won't <laughs> retaliate now. Uh, so turning now to the theme of the panel uh, concerning uh, the participation of African states uh, in shaping international law, um, I also, like uh, Professor Garvey, uh, come to the issue through a fairly strong uh, historical lens. Uh, we see, from, the, from my view, a strong and consistent commitment uh, on the part of African states uh, to embrace international law and embrace multilateralism in circumstances where there may be reason not to embrace international law, may, where there may be a reason not to embrace multilateralism uh, because of some of the underlying ideologies uh, that Professor Garvey outlined that are not just historical in nature, uh, but also contemporary in character. And I think it's a point that was also echoed by Professor Geldrich uh, concerning Africa not being a passive player in international lawmaking. So there's a historical dimension uh, to that. Uh, I'm going to skip 
uh, a little bit of the historical, because I had a little bit of that uh, analysis uh, that followed the period before decolonization. But let me highlight a couple of things in a way by way of echoing uh, Professor Gade's points. Uh, so firstly, of course, from the moment of decolonization, African nations uh, made their presence felt in the United Nations system. And one significant element uh, of this was the engagement uh, starting with the independence by Ghana uh, at the level of the United Nations, uh, pushing for uh, the self-determination of Af other African nations. I think there was a famous statement by uh, President Nkrumah uh, who said that Ghana was not free until the rest of Africa would be free. So this was the day of independence, a triumphant moment uh, for a country after a long struggle, the first Anglophone West African country to gain independence uh, from Britain. Uh, those Speaking attitudes. A little closer, okay, absolutely. I hope it's better now, a little bit more, okay. I think the problem is not in the room, but on the web. On the web, okay. Is it any better now, Kai? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, those attitudes uh, that reflected a commitment to using international law, even though international law had itself been implicated in the colonial enterprise, uh, reflected uh, uh, in the United Nations system itself. Uh, so for example, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, as leader of Ghana was one of those who spearheaded uh, the efforts to, that led to the famous UN Resolution 1514 uh, in 1960 concerning the Declaration on the Granting of Independence uh, to Colonial Countries and Peoples. Uh, that declaration was supported by many other African states that were independent at the time, uh, so Egypt and of course um, later on Kenya and Nigeria. And that, that declaration of course uh, serves as one of the fundamental moments in terms of the recognition of the right to self-determination and independence of colonial peoples. And if one, anyone has a doubt about the relevance of it, one only, only has to go through uh, the Chagos advisory opinion and some of the separate opinions of the judges, including Judge Yusuf uh, and Robinson. Uh, several other efforts in terms of uh, impact of the UN system. Uh, the resolution that dealt with the permanent sovereignty over natural resources, uh, which affirmed the right of all African states and all other states from different parts of the world to essentially have control over their resources. That had been the underlying, of course, underbelly of the colonial system. Um, in terms of international institutions, uh, the presence of African states and global South states generally uh, led to an expansion of membership of particular bodies. So for example, I had the great privilege of being in the International Law Commission. When the UN was uh, established the International Law Commission in 1947, you only had 15 members. Uh, so it was the presence and increase in the membership of the UN itself that led to a push by African and Global South states to expand the membership of the Commission um, all the way to 1982, where they settled on the final formula that today means Africa, in certain turns of the five-year quinquennium, would have nine out of the 34 members. That expansion, of course, was also in relation uh, to Asian states and, and Latin American states. It was an expansion that was resisted, I have to underline, by certain states and certain regions. So in, in other words, it's an example of an effort uh, to embrace and use international law institutions, including through representativeness uh, within the institutions themselves. Uh, when you think about substantive issue areas of international law, uh, the African contribution is very prominent. I'll just give a couple of examples. Uh, obviously, uh, for those who follow the law of the sea, uh, the so-called constitution of the oceans, uh, there was strong African presence and push. Uh, at Montego Bay, Jamaica, and Kenya is notably credited uh, with proposals uh, that led to what became uh, the exclusive economic zone that was included um, in the treaty itself. And more recently, if you follow the subsequent efforts with the so-called BBNJ treaty uh, that was adopted recently, the African group was very strong and prominent in pushing uh, the BBNJ negotiations, and they made an impact a significant impact on the development of that instrument. So just one example of a substantive issue area that reflects African participation in international law. I'll just give a very, another second and brief example before I move on. And that's my area of passion, international criminal law. I'm not gonna spend too much time on it, but I do wanna highlight, and this is a point that connects to what Professor Newman started out with earlier uh, when he gave his opening in highlighting um, the movement against apartheid. Uh, that movement against apartheid took a number of uh, uh, elements. So one aspect of it was a push uh, by Guinea together with the then Soviet Union to propose a convention on, uh, on apartheid that would criminalize apartheid as a crime against humanity. Uh, that was an effort that was not welcomed very well by its particular Western states that were allied with Pretoria at the time. And it's amazing as a historical matter if you went back now to see the parties to the apartheid convention. 
A lot of Western countries are in there. It's amazing. It goes back to the resistance in that period. Uh, but of course, African states pushed on, including uh, the idea of having an international criminal tribunal that will prosecute the crimes in the event that national systems do not step up. So there are strong provisions in the apartheid convention that later married on into what became uh, the Rome Statute, where apartheid was included uh, as a crime against humanity in the instrument itself. We all know, for at least for those of us who follow uh, international criminal law, that African states have had a complex relationship with the International Criminal Court, uh, but by and large have both pushed the establishment of the regime and in the negotiations at Rome, uh, the SADC group and the so-called like-minded group were quite prominent in pushing features of the instrument that were not welcomed uh, by Western states. For example, the idea of an independent prosecutor. Uh, for example, uh, the idea that the Security Council should have a more limited role um, in the work of the International Criminal Court, giving its nature as a political body. Uh, the proposal of the International Law Commission had provided basically the Security Council as the only trigger mechanism for the court, and that was widely resisted by global South states, including African states. Number for the initiatives, the, the level of the, uh, the Rwanda Tribunal, of course, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, um, accountability efforts in terms of the Truth Commission in South Africa and so on. So these are just examples, vignettes, so to speak, at the international level where we see African states engaging uh, with the ideas of international law and embracing international law as tools for their own uh, uh, purposes, but also uh, underlying the need for, uh, for international cooperation and underlying the need for multilateralism and international law. I'm not going to go uh, into the other discussion I was going to raise, which is uh, concerning uh, the, the principle of self-determination and the famous uh, Southwest Africa cases at the International Court of Justice, which connects very nicely to the discussion we're having about advisory opinions. I'm going to skip all of that. Uh, Professor Gabi has written quite extensively, and I was uh, in the room when he gave the Grotius lecture where he mapped uh, this engagement that he had as a student uh, with the African approaches to international law, mapped on uh, how international law developed in places like Arusha, Tanzania. Right? These are places you don't get to hear about, including the East African Court of Justice and in the African Court on Human and People's Rights, are not as well known as they ought to be as the laws developed in Geneva, The Hague, and other places in different parts of the world, and that those deserve uh, more recognition and engagement in academic discourse. Uh, let me, because of the time, uh, go to the final uh, set of points I was going to raise and abbreviate, uh, because this, course, this, co this conference and symposium as a whole uh, aims to focus on African perspectives and challenges in relation, in relation to climate change law. And I think Professor Geldich uh, raised some critical points concerning the Common but Differentiated Responsibilities Principle, which I know there's an entire panel on that after this, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. I do want to flag that African states have, as a consequence of this uh, enthusiasm, not sometimes not so well-deserved enthusiasm for international law, have definitely been key players in the development of landmark instruments. So it's, for example, the negotiations that led to the UNFCCC, the uh, Framework uh, Convention on Climate Change. Uh, more recently, we saw the uh, strong African push uh, within the context of the Paris Agreement. And we know uh, in Paris, uh, principles like common but differentiated responsibilities, as with the UNFCCC process, were very prominent. Uh, co uh, provisions concerning technical support and assistance for developing countries found their way. Again, these have been long mainstay positions for the African group. Uh, we see that uh, commitment to CBDR reflected now in the second aspect of what is happening these days, which is after the uh, IPCC has uh, underlined that Africa is the most vulnerable continent, uh, we see the efforts by states like Sierra Leone and other African states to engage at the level of um, the African Union with the development of a strategy uh, that uh, Professor Geldi spoke about, uh, but also the Nairobi Declaration on Climate Change, which was uh, adopted last year by the African states. I might add, in the context of Egypt's hosting of the COP27, African states saw and were united in the so-called SHIP, the Sharm al-Sheikh Implementation Plan, which led to the blockbuster development of global acceptance for the establishment of a loss and damage fund. Now, it's a different question whether that loss and damage fund will have the resources, given the historical patterns, uh, but it is a significant development <coughs> as a reflection of a long-standing advocacy that recognizes the common but differentiated responsibilities principle, but also recognizes the need um, for states that are in a vulnerable position to benefit from the 
the, the, the support uh, that those who have polluted and have gotten the world to where it is today um, ought to step up to their responsibilities, as uh, 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 Deputy Minister Sisi uh, suggested. Uh, let me just end with a note about the, the advisory opinions. Um, I know that uh, the inch from 7 to 11 is a positive. That's what uh, uh, Alpha suggested, and I agree with him. Uh, maybe in historical terms, I think Gus yesterday was reminding us that in nuclear weapons, we only had two African states. So in historical terms, maybe that reflects even bigger increase. Uh, but my disappointment is uh, we are increasingly aware of the impacts of climate change, in particular for African states. And I think there are efforts on the way uh, by African states, including pushing for the advisory opinions uh, at the ICJ in particular, to be active, to help in shaping international law uh, and pr providing their views. So for me, it's quite uh, a, a letdown to have out of 54 states, about only 11 states for the most vulnerable continent, um, because of course, ultimately, the court will be hearing from disparate views from different parts of the world. And of course, there will be an alignment in terms of global South states, Asian states, uh, the Caribbean and, 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 and Pacific Island states would generally be in this on the same page, so to speak. But I think it's important that even though the African Union itself had made a submission, that the individual African states themselves participate in presenting their own unique stories. I have the privilege of being, along with several colleagues, uh, co-counsel for several African states, and we're telling a different story because each of the clients are differently positioned. So for example, in Namibia, the problem is about the aridity. This is the driest country in the world. It has a big water problem, so you see the brief emphasizes the right to water and issues relating to international human rights and water law. With respect to Sierra Leone, you heard the arguments already uh, concerning being a low-lying coastal state and the impacts for countries like Sierra Leone with an extensive coastline. And then, of course, a different set of arguments in respect of Kenya. So that, in my view, underlines why more African states need to jump into the mix. Now, having missed the opportunity to provide written submissions, states will still be entitled to appear and give oral statements. So all is not lost. So for anyone out there who is connected with the government, <laughs> please do encourage them to participate. I'm going to stop there. We sat a little bit late, but I hope we have still a few minutes for some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And on that last note, you see why it's important that you have the microphone near you. <laughs> uh, are there questions from the floor? Please. Thank you very much. Um, it's going to be hard to keep it brief with the richness of the discussion that's taken place so far, but I'll do my best. Um, with regards to participation in proceedings, so with Chagos, which dealt very centrally with the issue of decoloniality and decolonialism in international law, one would have expected African states to come to the table very much, which we didn't see. Now, it's been mentioned already that you know, the figures we have now is 11 states with climate change, and it was also 11 states with three from Palestine that were in proceedings from Africa that participated within those proceedings. Yet, against the backdrop where we have African individuals playing really central roles in the development of international law and processes, so Professor Diallo is a good example, serving on the ILC, together with many other colleagues, and we have our dear colleague, uh, now Judge Claudi, recently elevated to the bench of the ICJ. Um, and we also see that African states participate in these multilateral processes very well. What gives with regards to this lack of participation in ICJ advisory proceedings particularly? I know 29 states from Africa have participated in contentious proceedings. Um, very few states participate generally in advisory proceedings. Is there anything that we're not doing right? Should we just one more? Yeah, whoever would like to. All right. Um, I'll take a stab at it, just a couple of points, and thank you very much. Of course, uh, uh, you are as much an expert on this and everyone here on the, on the podium. Uh, I have a couple of observations. So one is, my impression is, uh, when you engage with African states in New York, and those of them that are deeply embedded uh, in the processes of the United Nations, you get one message. Uh, when you engage with African states in capitals, uh, there seems to be some messages that are lost between what happens in New York and what happens in capital. It's not entirely the answer to the question, but I have the impression that even the level of awareness of where states themselves have co-sponsored a resolution or been part of the core group that led to something happening in New York is not necessarily well known in capital. And maybe part of the reason for that is con uh, questions about capacity. Uh, New York is a very complicated place. Uh, a lot of the permanent missions from African states are very small. Uh, they have, you are very lucky to have a legal advisor. I've met a lot of delegations where you have somebody who covers the sixth committee, which is the legal committee of the General Assembly, as you know, and they're not a lawyer. 
Uh, so there's a big problem, if you will, that comes to capacity building. That's one element. And secondly, I'm not certain that if you think of it in historical terms, that there's a much a, a deliberative approach to the ICJ now as there was in the past. Of course, the ICJ lost a little bit of standing in the eyes of African states after the Namibia fiasco. We've all gotten past that, and we see an increase in the engagement by African states in respect of contentious matters, but also now in these advisory processes. So my impression is, as we, they're bringing the ICJ back into the center of how they do business, there should be more of a connection between their advocacy and their views of international law, which led them to have a lot of confidence in the ICJ in the past, and to push even in the ICJ in circumstances when you think about you know, Liberia and Ethiopia in relation to what's happening in apartheid South Africa. But my colleagues probably have some additional points too, so let me just pause there. Well, it, it seems to me actually adversary opinions is where the good news is. <laughs> um, and I say that maybe it's uh, not a popular view, but I've, um, in my current writing project, I'm looking at contentious cases between 98 to the end of last year, in contentious cases. Overwhelmingly, all Global South states, overwhelmingly African states. Who do they appoint as counsel and advocate? 13 white men dominate their appearances. Um, so, you know, I think this is, you know, African states um, have to, you know, I, I take the capacity point, but I think it's a cop out, Charles. <laughs> okay. um, there's a historical legacy of domination of those proceedings by what I call, they call themselves actually the ICJ mafia. Uh, and, you know, so actually one of the reasons uh, Abadir, I, I really was excited to come here, was uh, because I am um, now writing a book on this. Uh, I looked at a picture of the, that was taken after one of those it lost proceedings. I saw my classmate Payam Akavan, my brother um, at the corner there, uh, Professor Bengu, um, I saw Catherine Amifor, I saw, well, so uh, when I saw that picture, something really occurred to me, that the importance of these advisory opinions, and Charles as well, the importance of, and, and our ILC colleague from Kenya, uh, the importance of this advisory opinion is they are creating a back door to hopefully capsizing the ICJ mafia. I could say more, but I don't want to say more. <laughs> Uh, so we have another question. Um, it is 1045, and so what I'd like to propose is that we make this a working coffee break. Uh, the coffee is there. Uh, please feel free to get up. Uh, uh, we also respect the human right to water and sanitation. Uh, and, uh, but we will keep talking uh, until it's time to start uh, the next segment. Please. Thank you so much. Giving me the floor, this one. Okay. Uh, again, mm, I'm very embarrassed and disappointed with the number of the countries, 11 on 55, and I need just to ask the question: Is it because of a lack of expertise, or it is because Africa has other priorities? Why climate change and environmental law is not a priority for Africans? This is the first question. Second one. What is the role of education, universities, mass media, civil society, and NGOs? Because you have just been saying, right, maybe we hope for the, uh, the, the, the African countries that come for the oral statement. So let's at least focus on that. How do you imagine the role of mass media, NGOs, and uh, civil society to push, and also academics as we are? Please. Um, so, I mean, that's a very good question. And I, I think maybe the ICJ is the wrong place to look. Look at Arusha, look at uh, uh, the ECOWAS court. I've written a whole article on judicial environmentalism in Africa. They are really precedent setting cases, uh, like the Serengeti case. The only case I'm aware of where a court injuncted a government, an international court, not to build a superhighway across the UNESCO wildlife, blah, 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 blah. Um, look at the amazing work done in the ECOWAS Court of Justice by activists and NGOs suing uh, Shell, even though they know the court has no jurisdiction, because they want, I've written a whole book about this. Um, um, on, so I think, personally, I think that there's tons of stuff that's going on. 
but it's not part of the usual conversation. Um, I, I think the ICJ, like I said, is the wrong place to look. I'm not saying African states should not participate, but there's been a ton of really important work done. L right now in the East African Court of Justice, they're trying to save the, Sereng the Maasai of the Kilimanjaro area who are being evicted uh, by the government of Tanzania, working with, uh, working with uh, private investors. Um, so um, I'm not answering the question about African state participation in the ICJ, but I want to say that African civil society groups Okay, another example, last example. My latest article coming forth in the Wisconsin Journal of International Law about carbon markets. African states have signed these gazillion uh, agreements with these investors from the Middle East and elsewhere who want to buy carbon credits. And in Kenya, the Ogie community, subject of two cases and two orders from the African court and the African commission, the Kenyan government is evicting an indigenous community so that the carbon credits can be, I mean, so, um, uh, you know, so, and, and these guys have been litigating for the last maybe 15 years. At some point, I interviewed the former Attorney General of Kenya, Gidu Moigai, Professor Gidu Moigai, who actually thought that uh, he had convinced the Kenyan government to be in compliance uh, with uh, the rulings of the African court. Uh, so I think we, we maybe want to change the lens and not focus too much just on the ICJ and it laws. I have the utmost respect for my colleagues who are litigating in those cases. Afronomics law is about to initiate some litigation like that as well, but in Africa, not in the ICJ. We are not a government like my colleague, Mr. Sise here. Um, so I think that there's tons of stuff that's been going on. I think we just have to pay you know, attention to my claim about Africa being an epistemic location for production of knowledge. It's not just the ICJ. But having said that, have you looked at the nuclear, the, uh, the uh, dissenting opinion of Judge Weramantri in the nuclear weapons case, in the Kasihili Sedudu case, um, uh, invoking African, he is a complete contributionist in those, uh, in, in, you know, so there's a ton of stuff there that we could mine. Uh, even though African participation has not been. And I'm also skeptical that working on sovereign debt, I'm also skeptical that all African states would jump in on the right side. Many of these, so let me say about something about the Africa Climate Conference. This was a conference run by McKinsey. Um, if you follow the work we do on economics law, if you follow the alternative declaration, this was a conference basically run by McKinsey. Um, the Kenyan government, in my view, is in the hands of the climate industry, the climate finance industry, uh, that is dodging the bullet on questions of responsibility. Uh, so I think we have to pay attention to the details. And if you want to pay attention to the civil society groups in Nairobi, they're the ones who have asked all the, all the challenges of the climate conference um, and the ways in which the climate conference was simply an occasion to endorse the agenda of the climate finance industry and not the types of concerns that I think are resonating in this conversation, in this conference about responsibility, especially of the countries that are most responsible. You know, I'll just um, add a few um, um, comments. Certainly, you know, I, I agree with you um, that um, um, there, there are certain, certain factors, you know, that uh, neg negatively impact um, the, the, the ability to engage, you know, one of course there's a lack of capacity um, at the at the national level, and um, and you know as, as you mentioned, um, it's it's um, even easy to see that when African states really participate in these proceedings, you know, sometimes representation um, from the, 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 the global north, you know, um, I mean we because you know are guilty of that, you know, at the Iglos Tribunal, we. Um, had um, counsel representing us from New York, um, or, or, or from in New York, because um, we're fortunate to have um, Professor um, Jallo, who, um, whose time on the commission and his um, interest and expertise on these issues have really driven um, Sierra Leone's engagement um, in, in this, you know, but um, not, not every country, you know, um, has a um, um, Professor um, Jallo. Um, so, Really, also noting that sometimes, um, like you said, you know, there are conflicts in priorities, you know, and um, sometimes participating in these proceedings also, you know, come at some cost, you know, and then you know you have to 
rely on um, um, external external support. And um, you know, could be you know one putting uh, a team of lawyers together, um, preparing submissions, for example, but even dealing with logistics. You know, um, for example, if you um, want to make submissions um, before the International Court of Justice, you actually need. Um, 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 embassy staff in um, the Netherlands or in the EU region to go and hand deliver the, 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 the written submissions to the ICJ. That in itself is a challenge, you know? And, um, um, you know, we, we had, you know, similar challenges at the ECOWAS court, you know, when um, it was a requirement of that um, to make submissions, you actually needed someone in Abuja, you know, to walk to the premises of the court, you know, and hand deliver the, the submissions. And so that really also affected participation. And then there was COVID, you know, and um, um, then the ECOWAS court started um, receiving um, submissions electronically and then started actually, you know, um, um, holding hearings, you know, virtually. And um, since then, you know, the court has not looked back. So I think, you know, these are also things that, um, um, you know, we should look at. Definitely we need um, um, to raise awareness at the national level, you know, and develop that knowledge base, you know. Um, and I think it also fits into, uh, in, in some of our countries, how we train our lawyers, you know. Um, sometimes we train lawyers, you know, just for um, um, yeah, domestic, domestic practice. You know, but I think you know if we can expand um, curriculum to um, cover litigation for um, and these mechanisms, I think um, um, that that will help. You know, I really also think um, I agree with you that you know African states can also really engage the mechanisms on the continent. You know, and um, um, get um, the mechanisms to uh, make their own contributions in developing the law. You know, and um, I think it goes back to. Um, some work that um, Charles and I did um, previously on international criminal justice, you know, when there were discussions around the Malabo Protocol. Um, I think everyone focused on um, um, the um, extension of the court's jurisdiction to deal with Rome Statute crimes, you know, and really people ignored the other issues that um, um, the, 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 the court will have jurisdiction over, which, you know, if we had engaged or if we engage now on those issues, it's really an opportunity for um, um, the court to really make a strong statement um, on contribution um, to the development of the law in all of these, these other areas. If I may add to just a very quick uh, point. Um, I agree in some respects with James. Um, I think uh, the focus on the international mechanisms may be coming at the price of the exciting developments happening at the regional level. Um, I tend to think also though that uh, in as much as we have to make efforts to recognize the valuable work being done on the continent and in continental institutions, that at the international level, there's also a need for African states to amplify their engagement. And I'm fully with you. One of the things I really loved about Kosis and Paya Makavan and Makan Mengi and their work in Hamburg was that Hamburg is my first time, first time, the parade of diversity of the world in terms of counsel appearing before the tribunal. That could not be lost on anyone. It should not be lost on states that go to the usual suspects, almost suggesting that their own people don't have expertise. Because when it comes to questions about capacity and financing, the likelihood that an African council would act pro bono for a government. If you go to James Gaddy now and say, can you represent Kenya on a climate issue? I'm going to bet you a good dollar, only a dollar, though, not more, that he's not going to say no. Right? He's not going to ask for $500,000 to do it. So my point is, the expertise is there. There are some structural problems. And just finally, education is key. I think we have to amplify concerns about environmental issues because, of course, the continent is very vulnerable. And as you know, I think you led efforts in introducing international environmental law in your own home university. We need to do more of that. Please join me in thanking this extraordinary panel. Thank you, Professor Martin.